Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. This week we share with you a number of tips if you're about to paint your kitchen cabinets. You know you have a lot of doors and drawers. How do you paint all of that at one time? Well, Chelsea drops by with some great tips. And you know another thing we hear a lot about people asking about how do you get rid of all of those stains that you have on your roof. A lot of uh, algae stains that are out there. You might be surprised how easy it is. Something you might even be able to tackle this weekend. And I'm going to share a simple solution on how to use a plastic milk crate to increase storage space in your kid's bedroom and create a little seat as well. All right, we've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. Now we're going to go to Wisconsin and see if we can help Daniel with a little icy problem there. Daniel, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for taking my call. All right, our pleasure. I'll tell you, um, tell us about uh, the problems you're having with ice dams, and we have Joe Truini, the ice dam pro, to solve all your problems. (laughs) That's a nice title. Can you stop over? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he drops by. He's just in Connecticut. That's just around the corner from Wisconsin. I'm a Green Bay Packer fan. I'll be right over. (laughs) Well, that's good. Anyway, it's where two hip roofs, like you can see on the picture, comes together, and it's over about three feet from where the other, the garage wall meets the house wall, and it's up in that valley, but it's not, that's why I can't find it. If it's hidden behind the garage wall or everything looks really well insulated, and I have venting, you know, the waffle vent things in them. Yeah, yeah, the styrofoam rafter venting. Yeah. I've been up in the attic. I even took part of the soffit off. Right. And I just can't figure out why I get an ice dam there. Okay, well, I can tell you, you might know this, uh, Daniel, but the reason ice dams form, two reasons. One is heat is leaking up through the ceiling of the living space and warming the attic, and Mm -hmm. there's not enough ventilation, meaning that you, you, you mentioned that you have a lot of insulation in the attic. Well, not it's not that you can't have... It's not that you can have too much insulation, but if it's installed improperly, if you have it jammed into areas where it's blocking the flow of air, then it's going to create a problem. And for people who aren't familiar with ice dams, what happens is the underside of the roof is warmed by air that's leaking up from the house, from inside the house, and it melts Mm -hmm. the layer of snow underneath the blanket of snow. And that water runs down, but when it hits the eave, the eave is sticking out beyond the house wall, right? So that's cold. It's not yeah. being warmed by the air. And so what happens is that that water runs down underneath the blanket of snow, hits that cold eave, overhanging eave, freezes, and, it's, and it has no place to go. And it builds up and forms what they call a dam. And then water will literally back up the roof and leak in because roofs are designed, of course, to prevent water, to drain water in one direction, down, not up. And it, once yeah. it gets up under the shingles, then you know it's only a matter of time, finds its way through plywood seams or wherever. Um, so the, the first thing you need to do, and I've done this cause I had ice dams. I live in Connecticut is I got a roof rake and I rake this. As soon as I have a more than four to six inches of snow on the roof, I get out the rake and I roof rake the snow off the bottom edge of the roof. Even, even if you only go up three or four feet, that's usually plenty. And that removes yeah. the snow. And if you remove the snow, obviously you're removing the water that will eventually leak down and freeze. So that would be the first thing you need to do. Then you have to make sure that insulation is not blocking any of the vents so that you do have good yeah. airflow up through the attic. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And that's what I read afterwards on the line two about a roof rake and raking that off. And I haven't done that. So I'm going to get me one of them and I'll have to do that. That's right. Absolutely. And plus, looking at these photographs, I do notice you have a relatively shallow pitch roof. It looks like a four pitch, maybe a five pitch. And obviously, the shallower the pitch, the more the snow is going to going to hang on hang out on your roof the steeper the pitch more often it's going to come off so yeah you've got a couple of things going on here that you know are, are going to increase the chance of an ice dam but if you follow a few of those tips i just gave you i think i think you'll be in good shape yeah okay well good daniel well um, be- best of luck on that i'm sure it'll help you out and i uh, appreciate you being a part of the show have a great weekend thanks you too
800-946-4420 is the Today's Homeowner Hotline, and it has certainly been busy this week. I think this uh, uh, getting into this new year, people are really starting to think about some of the things that, that they want to do, and we're glad to be here to be able to uh, help you out with any of the projects that, that you may have. We also uh, want to encourage you to send us an email anytime at todayshomeowner.com slash ask. We have a number of great calls that came in. Let's see if we can tackle some of those right now. I have a question about uh, stucco. I have superficial cracking. I want to get my stucco painted, but I'm afraid it's going to just show the cracks again. I'm wondering what I can do about that. All right, I'll tell you what, you know, painting stucco, um, a lot of people say, well, why would you want to paint stucco? Because, you know, um, it's that's why you get stucco, so that you don't have to do a lot of maintenance. But after a while, you will have some hairline cracks on almost any type of stucco system. And, of course, it can get dingy and faded and that kind of thing. But I'll tell you, if you do it right, you can get 15 years out of a stucco, out of a painted stucco um, wall if you do it right. Now, in terms of the cracks like that, the thing that's a problem there, just like any cracks, you're going to have expansion and contraction. So if you put something in there rigid, it's liable and most likely to crack again. So what I would suggest is getting a good good quality acrylic latex caulk and then make sure the crack is clean. You might want to take a thin bladed putty knife, just kind of run through it just a little bit, and then carefully caulk it. But you want you don't want to over caulk it. You don't want it to overflow. So make sure you have maybe a slightly damp rag that you can really wipe it down just to basically fill up the crack. Allow it to dry, I would suggest, overnight before you apply your paint over that. Now, the paint you're going to be using is also acrylic latex because it'll maintain a bit of elasticity with the expansion and contraction that comes with, you know, cold and hot temperatures. But if you do that right and just take your time and really get it done well, and heck, one tube will just about do the entire house unless you really have some big gaps. And that's all that's necessary in order to take care of the cracks before you do the painting on your stucco. My question was, I'm redoing a house and the paint, when we tried to paint the walls, kept bubbling and we couldn't figure out why. The guy put a second coat on, it didn't do any good. Uh, the painter also uh, sanded down the, the walls. It didn't do any good. He skim coated. Didn't do any good. <laughs> wow. And put an oil based primer on. Didn't do any good. So anyway, we got it down to a little bit. But uh, anyway, I was just curious about what would cause that. Well, there's a lot of reasons why. It sounds like you've you've certainly tried a few different things. But paint when paint doesn't adhere to a wall, it's usually for one or three or four different reasons. One, the surface prep wasn't done properly, meaning you're painting over a damp, uh, excuse me, yeah, it could be damp or a dirty surface and the paint's just not adhering. Um, if you're trying to apply oil paint over latex paint, that could happen. Excessive moisture, which this might be, if there's moisture coming through these walls, um, it's gonna blister that paint off. Um, and if you do use latex paint, if you if it gets exposed to moisture shortly after applying it, even if it's dry, but if it's not fully dry, that could cause it. So it sounds like, um, I mean, I hate to say this, but you may have to strip this down, sand it down, or even do right down to, I assume this is drywall, um, or whatever it is, get it down to the cleanest surface you can, remove all the dust, prime it properly, and then start again. And I would probably do this in one spot just to make sure it works. But you know, typically, you know, it's got to be dust or dirt or moisture or grease, something on the wall that's preventing the paint from sticking. Thinking about a generator, portable generator, and really don't know much about them. Some will call generators, some will call portable generators, some will call alternate generators. Uh, how do we plug into it? Where do we store it? Etc. Thanks. All right, great to share some information with you on that. Uh, a lot of experience in generators for a lot of different reasons, and basically there are three different types. You have a whole house generator, often called a standby generator, that can power your entire house, depending on how big your house is and the power demands on it as to how big that particular unit would be. But it's wired directly into your home and has an automatic uh, transfer switch that when the power goes off, it will automatically come on. Uh, you'll only have an interruption of just a few seconds. It's a fantastic thing, especially if you live in a rural area or you you know an area that the power goes off quite a bit. Uh, you certainly would be able to uh, benefit from having a standby generator. The second, the portable generators, boy, they can be pretty 
pretty big too. I have one that's actually a seventeen thousand five hundred wow. uh, watt. It's a it's a big boy, big heavy thing that that we use. But they also go way down to much smaller ones. And the thing you have to think about here: often people will overload these generators by simply depending on them too much. If you start hooking um, an air conditioner or um, you know any type of um, heater or anything like that, most portable generators will not handle that. Now, they'll handle a refrigerator, some lights, fans, few things like that. So sizing that generator is extremely important. There's a number of calculators, including one at todayshomeowner.com, to help you figure out exactly what size portable generator you need. We also encourage you, while you're at Today's Homeowner, to read some of the generator safety tips because there's very important. It's a combustible engine. It means carbon monoxide. It should not be used inside your house, on your porch, in your garage, no place anywhere near your home. It needs to be out away from the home a bit so that you're, uh, you don't stand any chance at that. Now, the other generator you were talking about was probably what they call an inverter. And an inverter is a much smaller one. Uh, I'll tell you where you see these a lot. You see them um, like tailgating at the football games. You see right, that little exactly. bitty yep. generator and it's so quiet. And uh, so you see those a lot. They tend to be more expensive, but they certainly will operate for a long time on primarily gas, but there are some that are propane, and uh, those can be very, very popular. Again, it's all about the sizing of the load that you're going to depend on from the generator in order to have um, the right one. But boy, those inverters are everywhere, and uh, yep. Honda must have made a few dollars off of theirs because, you know, like being around, um, when you know, up in the city there around New York and so forth, and you see yep. the street vendors out there, and every one right. of them have that one little bitty generator that they're living on. Yeah, I see them on cap sites all the time, uh-huh. and they're incredibly yep. quiet. And uh-huh. the ones we're talking about are relatively small. It's like the size of a small beer cooler, maybe. Very, very quiet, and they do run forever. And what I would recommend if you're thinking of getting a portable generator for your home is to invest, call an electrician, and invest in a transfer switch. This is exactly what I did, and it works amazingly well. And a transfer switch is nothing more than a small breaker box that they put inside your house and they wire it into the existing main electrical panel and it'll have anywhere from six to 12 um, circuits on it. I bought the six circuit one and each circuit's wired into a specific existing electrical circuit. So I have it on my refrigerator, on my well pump, on my furnace, things that are important Mm -hmm. for when the power goes out. And, And there's an outlet that they mount on the outside of your house. You crank up your your gas-powered portable generator, and you just plug it into this. Then you go inside, and you start flipping switches. And that's the safest, most affordable way. You're not going to power your entire house, but you're going to keep those key circuits running when this when the power is out. So that's what I'd recommend. And as Danny mentioned, don't ever, ever run these things indoors. I've seen them run in, in a garage with the door open. That's a no-no. I don't care if the door's open. It's got to be outdoors. So those are a couple of things to keep in mind. And it's always good to be the envy of the neighborhood when the power's out right. and, and you're nice and comfortable and uh, others uh, not so much. And it's time for our best new product segment brought to you by the Home Depot how doers get more done. Now, multi-position ladders have been around for quite a while, and they're really popular because they're so versatile, but they all have one drawback. They are extremely heavy, and I can certainly attest to that because I have one that you just about have to have three people to carry it around. So Warner developed a new model with power light rails to make it easy to move, um, so it's very easy to transport around all your house to do whatever you need to do. It has a 375-pound load capacity, reaches up to 18 feet, and be configured in up to 24 adjustable positions. I mean, it can be an extension ladder, a double-sided twin step ladder, a stairway ladder, a 90 degree wall ladder or two self-supporting scaffolding braces. Very, very versatile. The new shatterproof aluminum J-locks are easier to use and the oversized impact resistant push knobs make adjustments more comfortable and will protect the ladder for greater durability. Plus the extra wide flared bottom and skid resistant feet keep you safer while you're doing all of those projects around your house. So if you're interested in checking out the Warner Multi-Position Ladder just log on to homedepot.com. I, uh, hey, Danny, uh-huh. there's one other really great feature about that ladder. Yeah, uh-huh, and yeah. Those ladders, like, is that you can store them really easily in yeah, smaller yeah. spaces. Try storing an 18-foot 
ladder somewhere. It's like, okay, I guess it's going to be sitting outside. Yeah. You know, and, so and that, I mean, that's another really I mean, the trunk of a car, trunk of most cars, right. you're able to do that. And so that certainly helps. And for those that are, you know, in the trades, you're, you're always looking for ways to save room in your truck or what van or whatever you're using. So uh, that's good. That's good. And, you know, um, I, I had a dinner with um, the, the marketing uh, director for Warner and um, he told me, he says, you know how I got my position? And I go, well, no, I figured, you know, you worked hard, you did that. He goes, no, I called the NBA and I worked out a deal for my ladder to be in, in every game where they're cutting the, um, the, nets, the, down? the nets down. Oh, that's great. And he great. says, next time you see that, see if you don't see a Warner or thing. And, and it wasn't no, a week later, I saw this game, and I said, well, let me check it out. And they were all running around. They just won the game. And I go, Shh, they're going to bring out the ladder. And they brought out the ladder, and I'm telling you, he got a million dollars worth of advertising that is great. right then. So he says, that's how I got my job. <laughs> well, okay. It's, Very it smart. wasn't anything to Very do with smart. hard work. It was a lucky call. How do you like that? So, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, let's go right to Laura is out in uh, – Arizona, Laura, welcome to the show. Um, um, and tell us a tell us a little bit about your question here, because I think it's a good one. Good morning, and thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, my my question is, I'm about ready to do the floor trim on an entire 1,800 square foot home, mm-hmm. and um, I will either be staining it or painting pre primed trim. And on one of your previous shows, I saw a really neat product that was a sawhorse substitute and they looked to be from the show to be like a black plastic um, stackable product where if I were staining a whole length of floor trim, I would put one on each end of the trim and then could put another piece on top of it, which would be much better than laying the pieces down on either newspaper or a tarp. Um, and messing up kind of the corners of my job. And I haven't been able to uh, find this product at my Home Depot, and I wondered if you could reiterate again who it's made by and the other features about it. Certainly be more than happy to. I love those little devices like that, the good old problem solution things that you have all kinds of rigs and jigs and things that you're able to to do that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden you turn around and there's something already manufactured like that. That's one of the things when you have a daughter like mine, Chelsea, who absolutely loves to shop, she tends to find those kind of things like that. Actually, she's with us right now, Laura, to explain a little bit more about what you saw on that recent episode of the Today's Home on our television show. Hey, Laura, I'm so glad that you love those because I thought they were so neat, too. And they are called Stack Rack. So it's S T A K. R-A-C-K, and you can get them at homedepot.com. I think a set of them is around $70. So I don't know, a little bit of an investment, but I know that like if it that's one of those tools that once you buy it, you will think of a million different ways to use it. And we ended up buying um, two by twos and attached them to the stack racks with screws to create essentially a, an eight foot sawhorse. So that might be perfect for your project. Oh, that sounds great, Chelsea, and that's where I saw him as you were helping that young couple, I think, redo a kitchen cabinet. That's right. Mm -hmm. And and you were able to um, stack many, many more layers of work rather than covering some huge floor surface. Exactly. So thank you. It's the website, not the store. That's wonderful. Yes, yes. The website, they have a lot more things um, online and available, usually for free shipping as well, um, at homedepot.com, so you don't have to um, go to the store. <laughs> and how many were? How many come in a package again? Um, the pack we got had 12, so six, or, yeah, six sets. Okay. Does that make sense? That should, that should work. <laughs> yeah, that should be plenty. Because it's, it's, it's a lot of trim I've got ahead of me, and it would really be nice to have it up off the ground like that. Yeah, I love it. Well, good. There, There's a, a problem, and we just provided the solution, and glad we were able to tie everything together like that. And, and also, for our other listeners, if you're curious of what we're talking about, uh, we have it posted right now on our page at todayshomeowner.com slash radio. Laura, thanks so much for being with us, and let us know if we can help you again. 
Will do. Thank you guys so very much for an awesome show. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. That sounds good. Well, good. There we go. We tied that loop together. And, uh, you know, there's so many of those things out there, though, that, um, the, again, the problem solution, you, you think about, boy, there's got to be something out there. Boy, when you dig into things, you usually can find pretty good solutions in, in a lot of situations like that. Yeah, lots of little ga- gadgets and gizmos that... Um Man, if you can, I'm all about paying a few bucks to solve a headache. Yeah, exactly, (laughs) exactly. So, all right, we're rolling right along, and we're talking about a trending article on todayshomeowner.com. Right now, you can go to todayshomeowner.com, and in our search engine there, um, just put remove prevent algae stains, and you'll see the article that I'm going to kind of glance down here a little bit and tell you a few of the the different um, comments we've gotten. It's best to clean your roof on a cloudy day to prevent the cleaner from evaporating too quickly. And if you know the manufacturer of your shingles, you want to make sure you check their website for any special recommendations that they have. But most of the time, the best thing to use is oxygen bleach. You just want to make sure you follow the, uh, the Um, directions on the container and a good recipe which we will have listed on today's homeowner.com slash radio would say one quart of the oxygen bleach a gallon of water and one quarter cup of TSP, trisodium phosphate. We talk about it all the time, available at any paint store or home center. And you put these three together, one quart of bleach, one gallon of water, quarter cup of TSP, and then pour these ingredients into a pumped, uh, pump up a garden sprayer. Mix it real well and just wet that roof down with the solution. Allow it to remain on the roof about 15 minutes before rinsing it off. And to keep algae from coming back when once your roof is clean, you actually, and Joe, this is something that you and I've talked about before, which I think people would find very odd, is install a strip of copper or right. zinc coated sheet metal along each side of the roof just below the ridge. Explain that a little bit, Mr. Scientist. Tell us about that. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. It's Dr. Scientist. Oh, probably. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, Yeah. There. Uh, what happens is when the water from the rain washes down over these strips, they're toxic. They, they release... Um, whatever materials in it, whether it's zinc or copper, it washes down the roof and that's toxic to algae and it kills it. In fact, there's a product called Shingle Shield and I believe it's still manufactured by a company called Chicago Metallic. I've not checked that recently, but it was originally Chicago Metallic. You can find it online. And there are long strips. I think they're four or five feet long and they have a little bit of a bend in them, which is, acts as a little dam. So when the water washes down the roof, it, it runs over this and it helps wash the zinc down your roof. You attach it under the shingles up high near the peak of the roof. And over time, that will eventually rot away and you just replace it. I mean, it takes years and years, but it will. it's a sacrificial strip. In it. But that zinc ingredient washes on the roof and that will help kill algae and prevent it from growing in the first place. There you go. And I'll tell you, you can, you can go again, go online at todayshomeowner.com and read a lot of the comments. There's one, a couple comments here. Dot mentions, there's a large pond on um, my neighbor's property across the road from our house. Since these algae spores are airborne, could that contribute to the discoloration on our roof? I don't know, Joe. I, w- I would say very unlikely. I mean, there's... Yeah, I'm not sure you know. algae spores fly across the neighborhood. Maybe they do. Yeah. I think one way to tell is if the backside of your roof, which isn't exposed to it, doesn't have any algae, that might be you know, a way to tell. But of course, it's also dependent on how much sun it gets, how much how much moisture it gets. So, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, so if maybe the front of our house is in shade and the back isn't and it faces south, so maybe mm-hmm. the back of the house wouldn't have it. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. To, I'm not an algae spore expert, so unfortunately, I couldn't really tell you. And but it seems unlikely. Yeah, it does I would seem think. Unlikely. I would yeah. think so too. Here's another one from Briz uh, mentioned. Um, I read your article online at todayshomeowner.com, and I was a little skeptical, but it worked for me. Sprayed, so I sprayed it on slowly and heavily to each shingle. It got kind of nice and foamy. Waited, <laughs> waited twenty minutes or so, and I sprayed it off with a garden hose with a with the nozzle jet set to the nozzle set to jet and that was it the black is completely gone so i'm glad oh, great. glad that worked out real well one more comment um, or actually a question uh, sophia says i didn't realize those stains were algae cleaning the roof makes so much more sense now but i do have one question how do you know if the cleaner that you're using we recommend tsp uh, is able to be mixed with 
bleach? Will it always say so on the label, or do you have to do some online digging? And, of course, TSP and, and oxygen bleach is, is certainly fine, but uh, uh, that is uh, something. What, what were we mentioning the other day? That was so, bleach and ammonia. Yeah, bleach and ammonia. You never, ever mix. You never, yeah. ever mix that. That very creates important. a mustard gas, which right. is lethal. So yeah. bleach and ammonia, those are the two things you never want to mix. But, yeah, it's always, of course, smart to, to read the labels, every single label, if you can read them. They're printed right. so small these days. Yeah, they get so small. Um, yeah, but in any case, uh, yeah, th- I mean, those are the two things we always say. Never mix bleach and and um, ammonia. And the reason we recommend oxygen bleach, by the way, as opposed to chlorine bleach, is it doesn't dry as quickly. Chlorine bleach dries so quickly, it doesn't have time to kill the that's mold, right. mildew, algae stains, where oxygen bleach takes a lot longer to dry. So that, that's the reason we recommend that. Plus, oh. it won't bleach out your clothes and it won't kill that's plants. Right. That's right. You know, it's less toxic. Well, if you're having this situation at your house, I hope we've helped you. And uh, again, drop by todayshomeowner.com. We're always getting some great emails and everything, but I thought this was pretty good. So um, uh, let me show you, tell you, this is from Stan, and uh, here's how it starts. Good morning, Joe. Wait a minute. He sent that to you? I heard the segment on your sh- your show about <laughs> controlling access to your home by pest. So, um, so Joe, um, yes? I'm glad to be your co-host and yes, th- glad to be you. working on your show and all that, but... Uh, uh, so anyway, so he says here, and this is really cool because he had several different uh, things, but this is one that might hit home for a lot of you. Um, one of my post-retirement jobs was working in a garden department in an Ace Hardware store. I had several encounters with customers who were looking for a product to kill an infestation of small moths in their kitchen. My response to these people was to say, you're not going to like my answer. Then I would tell them that they need to clean their kitchen. <laughs> I would go on to explain that the Moths were likely breeding in a box bag or container of something in their kitchen. They needed to remove all containers from their cupboards and cabinets and examine the contents for evidence of any kind of insect larva or any type of caterpillar. I commonly got feedback that that they found an infested bag of something like cornmeal or flour. It was removed and the problem was solved. So uh, uh, there there again, you know, it's it's really, I mean, we we love it when uh, our Today's Homeowner listeners and podcast listeners send in things like this so that we can share them uh, with other people. But uh, there's a good solution right there. Just clean up your kitchen, all right? <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, if they're in there, they're, obviously they're, there has to be a food source, and, and it usually is something, some dry good. So um, I first discovered it in our pantry. I didn't see the moths, but I saw the larva when I dumped some rice into a pot of boiling water. And I saw these little things float to the oh, surface. I yeah. said, hmm, uh-huh. they don't quite look like rice. <laughs> and uh, so that's how I wound up dumping out that rice and getting some, you can buy now airtight containers for all that stuff. Right, that, right. You know, because cereal boxes are, you know, almost anything you can get into them. Unless you really want that type of protein, then you can just yeah, go ahead and just is, go ahead. It is ahead protein. Keep, that is keep, right. Keep, keep is stirring. Protein. Hey, here's, here's another one that came in. Terry writes, last year I tried my hand at starting my seedlings indoors for the first time. They germinated extremely fast and I was really unprepared. Right away I rigged up a light so that, so that um, I, but I could tell this would not be workable in the long term. So I used clear pas- plastic totes and took them outside during the day. The theory is the cold temps keep the seedlings from growing too fast. It keeps them from lower, uh, lowering to the planting medium. I'm doing this again this year. Big, pla- clear plastic totes with covers are like movable little greenhouses. So for me, the only drawback to sprouting seeds was putting them out in the great outdoors all by themselves. One one slug could clear out my newly planted darlings. As, a, <laughs> as, a, as an insurance, I uh, lined a circle around each one with Epsom salts. Works much like salt to repel snails and slugs. It's also very beneficial to very the seedlings. Very smart. That's so, a really smart use of those plastic tubs. So, Terry, thanks a lot for sharing that with us. Talking about pests, here's a trivia question for you we're going to let you think about. Many people think of ants as pests, but one ancient civilization actually used ants as a pest deterrent. Which civilization used ants and why? can't imagine uh, the answer to this, Joe, but uh, they only give me the question. They don't give me the answer. What's the answer? Well, they, they don't want you to have too much information. I guess right? not. Right. <laughs> well, the answer is in 1200 B.C., the Chinese discovered some um, predatory ants that would go around eating beetles and bugs and things that the 
Chinese, specifically farming Chinese, would consider pests. So they would they would get these these predatory ants and put them out, and they would eat up the beetles and the caterpillars and everything else. And they also to increase the the ants' chance of getting these these um, these other bugs, they tied ropes and strings to all the branches, so the ants had a little runway <laughs> up and down the tree, <laughs> wow. which, which the caterpillars were not too crazy about. Um, and if you've ever seen those nature shows about ants, they are unbelievably um, voracious oh, and yeah. aggressive, certain yeah. breeds, yeah. and incredibly strong. I remember reading when I was a kid, and I couldn't quite wrap my head around this, but they said if like an ant was the size of a man, it could, I forgot, like lift two cars over its yeah, head. No, I I thought, that. Yeah, I know. I thought, whoa, I'm glad they're not breeding them any bigger than they are. <laughs> we would all be working for ants right now if they did. So, That's uh, pretty good. so there you go. That's the answer. Not all ants are bad. All right, Joe, before we wrap up, how about sharing with us another great simple solution? All right, Danny, here's how to convert a plastic milk crate into a child's seat with storage. That's the key part. You can buy these milk crates at any hardware store or home center. They're really affordable. They come in several different colors. But to make it a seat, you start with a square of half-inch plywood slightly larger than the crate itself because it's going to overlap the, the edges of the, of the crate. And then you set a piece of two-and-a-half-inch thick foam rubber on top of the plywood and wrap it. And we wrapped it, actually, when I shot the Simple Solution, which you can find online at todayshomeowner.com. I just wrapped it in a brand-new canvas drop cloth. Really affordable, really durable, easy to clean. But you can use any, any kind of fabric. But anyway, well, you just wrap the foam in the plywood, staple it along the bottom. Then I screwed on four one by two cleats around the edges of it. And that's just to keep it from sliding off the crate. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, mm -hmm. I mean I guess you don't really, don't really need the cleats, but it does keep the cushion from sliding off. And then you just set the, the crate in the kid's room with the opening facing up, obviously. Fill it up with toys or books or whatever you want to store. And you set this right on top, this little seat on top. And it's, it's just the right height for kids, probably from like three or four years old down, right, where they can sit comfortably. And, you, and it teaches them to store away their stuff at the end of the day. And it's their own little little seat. So you know That's that right. they just, just absolutely love right. that. So pretty good. Well, we'll remind you that you can see over 500 Simple Solutions on todayshomeowner.com slash simple solution. And if you have a simple solution, we always welcome uh, you to send that in so that we might be able to share it with all our listeners all over the country. Now we want to share with you our DIY Project of the Week. This one is about how to install a toilet in six easy steps. First step, turn off the water supply located beneath the tank, flush the toilet to release all of the water from the tank, and pour a bucket of water very aggressively into the bowl to create a vacuum that forces out whatever remains in the bowl. And then you want to disconnect the water supply line. Don't forget, you have to turn that off first. But then disconnect the water supply line that's typically located in the bottom of the tank. And you want to do that before removing the closet bolts, which are the bolts in the floor to actually hold the toilet to the floor itself. And then comes the ugly part of it is to scrape the old wax ring off the toilet flange and add a new wax ring on the flange. Uh, the protruding tip of the ring goes down inside the drain pipe under the flange. And I would certainly suggest using some gloves and a thin bladed putty knife will take all of that old wax ring off. And I want to share a quick tip for when you want to replace the toilet, whether you're putting the old toilet back or installing a brand new toilet. You have to very carefully set it down over the, the bolts, the closet bolts are sticking up out of the floor, but they're pretty long and it's hard to get them all lined up. We'll try this. Take four drinking straws and slip them over the bolts so they're extending up. All you're doing is giving you an easier target to shoot for as you lower this down. And if the toilet's really heavy, you know, obviously just get help and set it down right over the straws and then right over the the bolts themselves boy that works great and if you've ever if you've ever tried to just land that toilet just right when you're putting it down there you'll really appreciate this drinking straw technique also protects those threads so that you're not That's scarring right. up the threads as you're putting it down that's a great tip also number five step is when the toilet and bolts are in position press down on the toilet to compress the wax ring to seal it off real well then remove the straws and add a plastic cap washer 
metal washer and nut to the closet bolts that basically is what holds it down to the flange. Nut should be snug, but not too tight, or it might crack the porcelain base. Unfortunately, ah, I've done that a time or two. Yeah, the, the trick there is snug them up and then leave the toilet and use it for two or three days or a week or whatever, and you'll see it might settle down a little more and those nuts will be loose and you tighten up a little bit more. But yeah, do really be really careful about that. And just use a wrench, not, not a socket wrench, which creates too much torque. Um, and then once those are nice and tight, you may have to trim off those bolts if they're new and they're too long, but once you get them trimmed, then snap on those plastic caps to, to hide them, turn the water on, and, um, and you're basically done. Check for leaks, of course, but at that point, you're basically done. And in some places, it's against code to caulk around the base of a toilet. You might wonder, well, what's the point of that? That'll keep water from washing. You know, if I'm washing the floor, it'll keep water from flowing under the toilet. But the reason they, they, that code is in place in most places is if there's a leak under the toilet, guess what? That water won't come out and you won't notice it until it's way too late and it causes a lot of damage. So if you're about to tackle the chore of replacing a toilet, I hope these six steps will help you a lot. Hey, let's roll right into our podcast question of the week. If you'd like to send us a question, do so just by going to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Ryan, who regularly listens to our podcast, uh, wrote in, I don't know who to contact, but was hoping for a little help from you and Joe. I have a large leak in my third floor bedroom under my window after a hard rain, but there's no obvious leak. The window's dry, no water on the wall or ceiling. What's going on and who can I call to get some help? Well, um, you know, I suspect there's a dormer involved in that or some place like that. But I'll tell you what, um, a roofer that uh, routinely does residential work, uh, they've got a really good eye for that. And like a roofer um, I used to work with a lot and everything, he says, you just have to think like a raindrop. You know, what, <laughs> what would you do if you were a raindrop? You know, so, uh, and I guess there's a little bit of wisdom to that. Kind That's of, right. Kind of weird to think like that because raindrops don't think. But anyway, um, you know, you just have to think about it tracking because wherever the water shows up on a leak often is not where the leak's coming in, which sounds like the case here. But um, going outside and checking because that, that water can be tracking around uh, inside that frame and then dripping wherever it has an right. exit point. Uh, but sometimes it can be pretty difficult. Well, I had a similar situation, and I'll tell you where I found the leak, is directly under the windowsill on the outside, where the siding came up and butted up against the underside of the windowsill. It was never caulked. It was never flashed, and there wasn't a flange on this window. Oh, yeah. Um, so I pulled down the siding, and, and you wouldn't see the – I noticed a leak in the, ba in the bedroom down below, but when I – when I investigated more, I pulled the drywall off on the inside under that window, and the studs and the insulation were wet. Oh. It wasn't wet enough to that I noticed it on the drywall. Um, but anyway, so what I did is I cleaned up the outside as well as I could. I put up some, some caulking, some flashing, and that solved the problem. So that I would definitely check there first. And again, this is directly under the sill on the outside of the window where it butts up against the siding. You know, over the years, remodeling so many different houses, you and you're, you know, deconstructing certain things before you move forward, whether, whether it's a bathroom or any other room, you can really see how a lot of these leaks um, happen when you take a section of drywall off around a window or door right. and you see some, some water damage there, some rot, uh, and you say, well, why did that happen? And you can kind of, you know, just backtrack and find out it was just one nail, it was just missing a piece of, uh, just a little bit of a crack because of missed caulk. Uh, a lot of different ways there. It's, it doesn't take much with a heavy rain for it to force its way uh, in your house. And uh, leaks are never good no matter where they are. Hey, I certainly appreciate you uh, spending some time with us uh, here on the podcast. And uh, we always uh, encourage you to send us any question or comment that you may have. It's pretty easy. Today's homeowner.com slash podcast. And always a big thanks for these great reviews we're getting on the Today's Homeowner podcast. It really makes us work that much harder to bring you the kind of information that you want. Hey, I'm Danny Lippert along with Joe Truini. Thanks so much for listening to this podcast.